Good morning and thank you all for joining this uh, 2018 UCAMS Lecture Award uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the winner, Rafaela Bonsanti, who will have a talk, a, a talk afterwards during this session. As uh, you are all probably aware, the uh, lecture award is uh, given to uh, an early career researcher that works in a country that has a UCAMS member organization and is meant for scientists within 10 years of their PhD. Usually uh, the winner has to give uh, a lecture in either uh, an ECC Congress in our European Chemistry Congress or in a Congress of our professional networks. Of course, due to the pandemic, none of these options were possible, but we are very happy that we have managed to arrange this online celebration with her lecture on online. Can I have the next one, Laura? Okay, uh, well, you all are aware of what the lecture award is, as I have just explained, and I would like to emphasize that there are open calls in this uh, subject. First of all, there is one for new candidates for next uh, year, for 2020, and uh, this uh, will be closed uh, at the end of, of the year. But I would also like to point out that there is a call to nominate members of the jury for this so-called International Award Committee. And also we have uh, asked our member societies, our professional networks to nominate new candidates for this uh, jury. Uh, the actual composition of the committee is the one you have on the screen. It's chaired by Barbara Albert, and uh, it's also integrated by Sabine uh, Flisch, Gaetano Guerra, Stefan Vogel, and Manuel Yanez. First of all, I would like on behalf of UCAMS to thank them all for their work. And, and in particular, I would like to thank Barbara for chairing and also for being present today. And uh, I think with uh, any further comment from my part, I will leave the floor to Barbara Albert. She's going to do the laudatio for, uh, for Rafaela. And then we will have a chance of listening to Rafaela's conference I'll bite on online. So thank you very much, Barbara. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, President Goya, dear awardee, Professor Rafaela Buonsanti, and ladies and gentlemen. It's a big pleasure. And of course, I would like to start with congratulating um, Professor Buonsanti um, for having um, achieved uh, so wonderful scientific results and for having um, been granted today um, by this award, the UCAMS Lecture Award. Let me introduce you to Professor Bonsanti for a moment. Um, I already mentioned that she is professor and she's professor at Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne um, today. And before that, she was postdoc um, um, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, originally, her PhD she did in Italy at, um, between 2006 and 2010, the group of Professor Cozzoli. Nowadays, she has an independent research group and she is very, um, very productive in terms of um, uh, getting very nice new scientific results and also publishing them in um, high quality journals and has a very impressive uh, impact and um, uh, like as you could see in the indices and um, she has a very high um, age index. Um, also she is active in uh, scientific um, uh, management and um, the handling of, um, of uh, reviewing. Um, she is active in several boards, journals of important journals, um, scientific advisory boards of Dalton Transaction, Nanoscale, Chemical Communications, ACS Materials Letters, Chemistry of Materials, AC Catalysis. You can see that this is a very impressive list and uh, lots of work, of course, um, but also very, it's, it's kind of um, 
you see that the society is already honoring her um, her expertise and um, even at such a young age she's um, very sought after as an expert on um, nanochemistry and catalysis so um, um, furthermore she has already um, uh, received several awards um, um, not only the today's Euro European Chemical Society Lecture Award, but also the Royal Chemical Society Chemcom Emerging Investigator Lectureship, um, uh, an endowed chair from the Sanders Family Foundation and um, the Team Chemistry Journal Award. So um, it's a very impressive CV um, and um, I'm very glad that uh, we got the chance uh, to get you today even if it's only on a virtual way but um, to, to get the chance to um, learn more about your research Rafaela um, we're very much looking forward to your lecture um, and I would like to congratulate you again um, on um, having um, received this award um, for young scientists um, which is already I think an award which has achieved a good reputation in scientific community um, and it's very nice to have this European award um, because nowadays uh, I think we all value um, what Europe means to us. And um, um, if scientific community isn't a collaborating uh, European committee, uh, European um, community, I wouldn't know what community should be a European community. So I think we can be a good role model for everything else, which seems to be so um, confusing at the moment. Uh, um, and um, we scientists, I think we, we hold together. So I'm very much looking forward to your talk, um, Professor Buon Santi, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. So, First of all, I would like to thank very much the European Chemical Society for the award. It's an honor for me to deliver this lecture talk online. So hopefully next time I will be part of one of the uh, conferences as an attendee. But uh, for today, it's a pleasure to share with all of you some of the work that I've been doing at uh, EPFL in the past five years. So here at EPFL, I'm a tenure track assistant professor and what you see here on the back are some of the beautiful mountains who are close to our campus, who is in Sion, actually. So EPFL, that's the main campus in Lausanne. And then um, we have different satellite campuses, and one of these is in Sion. Uh, and this is called Energy Police because the main team of this campus is energy. So my group works at the interface between inorganic material chemistry, so nanochemistry, as was mentioned just by before, and uh, electrocatalysis. And particularly, we have been devoting uh, quite a bit of effort in advancing uh, the, uh, the um, knowledge that we have in the conversion of CO2 into chemicals and fuels. Why this transformation is important? So based on the uh, sustainable uh, development goals set by the United Nations, affordable and clean energy and climate action are key to move towards sustainability. And the two of them are actually strictly uh, connected to each other because uh, as CO2 increases in the atmosphere and most of CO2 comes from uh, uh, coal and oil, we must move toward renewable energies. The problem with renewable energies is that they are discontinuous. And that's why uh, as scientists, we must work on uh, energy storage technologies. So it's not uh, um, a case that the uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry of 2019 was given to lithium ion batteries. So batteries are a great choice when we want to store energy on short term. Instead, if we think about storing energy more on a longer time scale, we can think about storing energy into chemical bonds. And this is exactly what plants do, because what they do is that uh, they take CO2 from, uh, uh, from air and the energy from the sun, and then they make sugar, which are high energy dense molecules. So the concept that we want to develop is, uh, can we um, create an inorganic system that can do the same transformation and produce useful chemicals? 
the idea is then to take CO2 from uh, point sources or eventually from uh, the atmosphere, uh, electricity from renewable, and make all the chemicals that nowadays are extracted from petroleum. Why are, not, uh, why are we not doing this at the moment? Well, we are missing uh, uh, a key component, which is the catalyst. CO2 is a very stable molecule, so we need a catalyst that can break these bonds and can form selectively new bonds. Well, why we don't have a catalyst? We don't have a catalyst because uh, the CO2 conversion pathway is extremely complicated, and uh, theorists and experimentalists are still working together to try to figure out what is the mechanism of this conversion. Uh, some initial results are coming out. And so if we focus on the simple first step, which is the conversion of CO2 to CO, experimental evidences suggest that the rate limiting step of the reaction is the first electron transfer, which leads to the formation of CO. And if we then focus on uh, um, CH4 or uh, ethylene, uh, the rate limiting step for the formation of methane is uh, the formation of this CHO intermediate. Instead, to produce ethylene, we need to have CC coupling. Among different metals, uh, copper is special because it has an intermediate binding energy towards this key intermediate, CO and CHO. Something like silver and gold, they are actually highly selective to make CO because they don't bind CO too strongly. And so the reaction proceeds from CO2 to CO, and then eventually CO leaves the catalyst surface, so it cannot go farther. Other metals, they bind CO2 strongly, and so they get poisoned, and the reaction cannot proceed. So copper is special. At the same time, if we use a copper foil, we are going to produce 16 different products. So this will be a separation nightmare. A Japanese scientist, Ori, uh, discovered that uh, um, using single crystals, uh, certain orientation of the copper surface are more selective for certain products. So in this case, the 100 surface is more selective for ethylene, and the 111 surface is more selective for methane. Of course, a single crystal is, uh, is uh, ideal for uh, uh, study the structure uh, uh, properties relationship, but it cannot eventually be implemented into an actual device. So when I started my group, the uh, researchers uh, around the world had already started to see that by changing the size and shape of copper, you could get some impact on the selectivity. Um, at the same time, there were also some contradictions. For example, some groups finding that copper spheres were producing methane, other groups finding that uh, um, copper spheres actually produce uh, ethyl, uh, hydrogen, so are basically not selective for the CO2 reduction. So at this point, we decided we could contribute with our knowledge in the formation of nanocrystals to the field. So what we use is a, uh, is a colloidal chemistry, which allows us to build nanocrystals atom by atoms. We use a three-neck flask, and we basically properly choose precursor and surfactants, we modify some reaction parameters so to obtain our final nanocrystals. And these surfactants actually, they play a key role in the synthesis because for example, by changing the steric hindrance, we can change the sides or by changing the binding energy uh, to different facets, we can also change the shape. So what we, uh, you will hear actually more about this topic from uh, Valeria, from my student Valeria, which will give a presentation soon after me. So she will provide you with the details about this work. What I, what I want to uh, say is that by playing with the chemistry and understanding the chemistry, we were able to synthesize these uh, copper uh, nanocrystals as uh, spheres of different sizes, cubes of different sizes, and octahedra of different sizes. And in agreement with uh, Professor Roldan Quenya and uh, Professor Strasser, we did find that these spheres, uh, they produce mostly hydrogen. So they are not highly selective towards, uh, um, hydro, uh, towards CO2 reduction. At the same time, we, find, we found a very unique behavior, a very uh, unique size-dependent behavior of this catalyst. Uh, specifically, when we, um, when we um, studied the cubes, in agreement with the single crystal studies, we did find that the 100 surface is more selective for ethylene, and the 111 surface is more selective for methane. 
However, we did find something special that uh, the intermediate sizes are the most selective for CO2 reduction. So here I report the Faradaic efficiency versus the size. The Faradaic efficiency is a percentage and indicates how much of a certain product is uh, released. And here, this is ethylene. So the middle size cubes were producing really a lot more ethylene compared to the others. And in the case of the, um, uh, the uh, octahedra, the methane was really produced uh, up to 50%, again, from these intermediate sites. Now, when we change the size, of course, we do change the, the uh, surface to volume ratio. But what we also change is the ratio between facets. And in particular, we change the ratio between facets, between the 111 facet and 1100 facet in the case of the cubes, and the ratio between the 110 and the 111 facet in the case of the octahedra. And why these matters? Well, this matters because my colleague, uh, uh, Clemence Corbin-Wolf, that is a theorist, helped us understanding that is really this interface that is crucial for the CC coupling, which leads to the formation of the ethylene. And therefore, these intermediate sizes basically provide us with an optimal ratio to move towards the formation of this product. Now, the results that I showed you so far were performed on what we refer to as an H cell. In this H cell, the CO2 is dissolved in uh, water. And because there is a solubility limit of CO2 in water, uh, uh, we are capped in the efficiency of the device. So what actually has been shown in the literature that will allow to uh, achieve um, uh, commercially relevant current density is the utilization of a gas-fed electrolyzer where the CO2 is supplied as a gas. Now, this requires quite of a big change. This means quite of a big change from a catalyst perspective, because in an H cell, the catalyst is just deposited on a flat glassy carbon. Instead, when we move towards a gas-fed electrolyzer, this catalyst is deposited on what we call gas diffusion layer, which is much more complicated. And this means that the microenvironment around the catalyst in terms of uh, mass and electron transport is really different. So we wanted to verify in such a different environment how much the intrinsic uh, um, uh, behavior of the catalyst, the intrinsic activity of the catalyst matters. Now, one thing to keep in mind about these colloidal nanocrystals is that uh, uh, they are constituted by this inorganic core, and then we have the ligands, and these ligands make them soluble in a large variety of solvents. So now basically we have a hink and we can easily take this hink and integrate it on a gas diffusion or in an H cell, so just deposit on a flat glassy carbon or integrate it in a um, gas diffusion layer. So this is what my postdoc Gianluca did. So he basically was able to create this gas diffusion electrode, which uh, uh, integrate the, the copper catalyst. And we were able to verify that the, select, the intrinsic selectivity of this catalyst is still preserved in this different environment. And was especially key to observe the formation of methane that we were expected to be suppressed based on the highly alkaline conditions that develop in this type of cells. Instead, this result told us that playing with the, the, the catalyst design is important even when we move to this uh, commercially relevant high carbon density. Now, another uh, uh, possibility that uh, uh, these uh, uniform nanocrystal offer is because they are so monodispersed in size and shape, they also are a beautiful platform to study reconstruction of the catalyst while the catalyst operates. Because actually we, we synthesize these catalysts as perfect cubes, but then we also have to, uh, to monitor if anything happens during the, the electrolysis. And the data that I showed you so far were acquired after one hour. And in this hour, the catalyst, the cubes are stable. Then my postdoc, John Fang, he monitored how the catalyst change over time. And what he noticed is that there are clusters detaching from this catalyst. And then eventually they coalesce. What was also interesting for us is that when uh, um, we perform three-dimensional electrotomography, we observe that these clusters detach really at the interface between the facet and the edges, which is really where we thought the active sites are. 
And uh, it's actually a confirmation if one believes that uh, the more active a catalyst is, the faster will degrade. This is also a confirmation that uh, is really where the reaction is happening. Uh, in this case, we work with another theorist uh, and um, together with a lot of uh, um, uh, control experiment, he helped us to elucidate the reason why the cubes change shape is because uh, the 100 facet becomes unstable when we apply such a negative potential. And so going forward, this means that if we are able to activate this catalyst at much lower potential, they will be stable. Now, what I showed you to, uh, now for this work, what Jianfeng did, were ex situ uh, imaging of the catalyst. So we wanted to go a step further, and in collaboration, uh, my student Yang, in collaboration with my colleague uh, Vaso Tileli, uh, we started to develop uh, a um, custom-made setup to look at catalysts while they are uh, uh, functioning. So what I'm showing you here is a video of uh, uh, initially eight nanometer copper nanoparticles as they evolve during the reaction. So we can apply the potential and run the CO2 reduction and observe the catalyst while it's changing. So what we observe, I will run, so you don't see these initial eight nanometer particles because they are too small when there is a liquid in between, but you clearly see that they start growing as the reaction proceeds. So what, uh, um, What uh, um, uh, Jan did then was to analyze the uh, particle size distribution. Um, I think there are problems with the, with the video. One moment. Yes. Okay, so what Jan did was to start to analyze the particle size distribution over time. And what we saw is that the small particles uh, uh, shrink while bigger particles grow. But the bigger, the small particles actually are not sintering and forming the big particles, are actually dissolving in solution. And this dissolution in solution is not really straightforward to understand because actually what the combination of in situ electron diffraction and operando X ray absorption showed is that at the beginning, so as we put our catalyst in the electrolyte, the catalyst is in, is in an oxidized state. But as we apply the negative potential that is needed for the CO2 reduction, the copper reduces. So basically we have an Osbar ripening like process while copper is in a reduced state. So this is quite intriguing. We basically highlighted in the end the role of this oxide in an initial dissolution of the catalyst. Then as soon as we apply the potential, these copper ions uh, initially released in solution start to redeposit on the substrate, but then eventually the process continues through intermediate transient species. And now we really would like to identify what these copper transient species are in order to understand better the process and eventually uh, engineer the process that is occurring. So what we learned so far is that uh, by changing the size and shape of the copper, we, we try to gain some degree of freedom on this activity map that I showed you before. Now, what is the problem with this? This is normally referred to by theorists as a volcano plot. This is just a two-dimensional volcano plot. So what we learn is that we can gain some degree of freedom by changing the size and shape of copper. However, if we want to stabilize further this uh, intermediate and so promote further the electrochemical CO2 reduction, uh, we, we find problems because if we uh, move towards this catalyst, which, have, uh, uh, which bind this intermediate stronger, as I mentioned before, we also um, poison this catalyst because they will bind strongly also the CO. And this is because all the CO2 reduction intermediate, they, they bind to a carbon atom. So in order to break what are called scaling relationship, we really need to start to mix copper with the different uh, materials. And uh, um, the problem is that we still don't have input from uh, theorists because we don't, we don't really have uh, a reaction mechanism. So what, what we have been doing in the group is kind of utilize a bit of our chemical intuition and our uh, materials chemistry 
in order to start testing some hypotheses and trying to understand how interfacing copper with different components might change the selectivity in uh, uh, CO2 reduction. So the first work that I will share with you is uh, the work of my student Denas. Here, what I mentioned before is that uh, this uh, um, CHO intermediate is crucial to form a CH4. So if we want to promote the electrochemical CO2 reduction and the production of CH4 instead of uh, hydrogen, we would like to stabilize this intermediate. If we take inspiration from CO2 hydrogenation, actually in CO2 hydrogenation, a similar intermediate form and is stabilized by creating uh, interfaces between uh, uh, ceria and copper metals. Now, we cannot directly translate this catalyst to uh, electrochemical CO2 reduction because if we have big particles of oxide, we cannot have electrons going through easily. So we have to miniaturize the system, basically. And this is what Benaz did. So she basically created these catalysts, which are constituted by a, a sphere of copper and a sphere of ceria. And they really share an interface between them, despite the existence of a high lattice mismatch. The way in which she synthesized them is by what we refer to as seeded growth. So basically, she has in her flask some cereal seeds, and then she heterogeneously nucleates the copper in the presence of some ligands. And these ligands I will show you later that are crucial for these uh, um, catalysts to form. So what Benaz found is that when she compared these uh, heterodimers with uh, the mixture of the two uh, domains separately, she did indeed observe that uh, the CO2, uh, that the hydrogen is uh, tremendously suppressed and that the CO2 reduction reaction is promoted. And among all the different products, this is methane. So the methane is dramatically enhanced. Again, we, uh, in order to explain this behavior, we basically found that there is a charge transfer from the copper to the uh, ceria, and this contributes to the reduction of the ceria during uh, uh, the electrochemical CO2 reduction, and the reduction of the ceria is accompanied by the formation of oxygen vacancies. And another theorist, this time Argia uh, Baumic from DTU, uh, helped us to understand that this, C, this uh, CHO intermediate is uh, stabilized by the interaction of uh, oxygen with the ceria, because there are oxygen vacancies, so it really likes to stick on the ceria at this point, and the carbon on the copper. So we are basically creating these bifunctional sites in this catalyst. And at this point, we wonder, well, maybe if we increase the surface area further, the interface area further, maybe we can improve even, uh, we can even improve further the, 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 the performance. So again, Benaz, she was able to play around with the chemistry and to be able to have uh, not only one sphere of Syria, but more uh, sphere of Syria surrounding the copper domain. The way in which she did it is to play with the chemistry and uh, to substitute different ligands. In this case, the ligands that she uses contribute to form different complexes with the copper, and these complexes have a, a different stability during the reaction, and they, they lead to different products. Now, what we found here was a bit contrary to our expectations, because what we found is actually that as the interface between the copper and the ceria increases, so as we add more spheres of copper, the CO2 reduction is actually not promoted at all. So what we learn from here is that, okay, the interface is important, but because it eventually is the copper that is active towards the CO2 reduction reaction, we do need to have a good balance between the interface area and the surface of copper that is available for the reaction to occur. We are still looking a bit more into the details because actually here the story is a bit more complicated than how I'm presenting, but I will say that this is the main conclusion that we get so far. Now, the point is that the reason why Syria was producing methane is that it really binds the oxygen very strongly. So now the idea was to move towards oxide that don't bind the oxygen too strongly to eventually be able to evolve, for example, methanol instead of methane. And the, the, the synthesis that Benas developed is really applicable to other uh, copper metal oxide. And so now she's playing around with them 
and seeing if we can switch the selectivity from methane to methanol. So interfaces are important. And I will show you another example of how these interfaces are important in the case of uh, copper uh, and uh, silver. So this is work again of my uh, uh, postdoc uh, Zhang Feng, who is now a professor back in, uh, in uh, China. Uh, so he, Zhang Feng, synthesized these dimers with silver and copper. Again, we have a very sharp interface by TM, so there is no alloying or electronic effect involved, as far as we can tell. And again, here, when we compare the dimers, where there is an interface to a physical mixture, in this case, we really promote CC coupling. So when we have a system like copper and silver, a phenomena that occur is referred to as tandem catalysis, because uh, the silver makes CO and then the copper takes care of converting CO into a different product. And, uh, um, but here there was, so this is what happens in the physical mixture. Instead, when we create an interface, there is something more going on. And in this case is, is again, a charge transfer from the copper to the silver, which consent to modulate the CO binding energy to this partial charge, uh, similarly to uh, an example that was reported in the literature. Now, always talking about interfaces, I mentioned ligands before. So a question that comes up often when uh, uh, we discuss our work is, well, what happens to the ligands during catalysis? Do they have any effect? Now, in most cases, we do remove the ligands with uh, uh, some treatment before actually doing catalysis. In other cases, the uh, ligands might desorb uh, in the initial stages of the catalysis. But then um, what uh, uh, James started doing is also to start to play with the ligands and to use ligands as co-catalysts. So James comes from an homogeneous catalysis background. And normally in homogeneous catalysis, you do use ligands uh, to modify the behavior of your catalyst. And so he joined the group and we started to explore this possibility. And this first work was about using these imidazolium-based ligands, where basically the imidazolium group interacts with the CO2. And then he changed the uh, anchor group and uh, the tail group. So he really did a very systematic uh, study, changing the anchoring group, well, keeping the imidazolium group and changing the tail length of these ligands. And we found again something that was quite surprising thanks to this uh, tunability that we are able to achieve. So actually we found that the highest efficiency towards CO and the highest intrinsic activity, which is represented by the current density normalized by the uh, surface area, is that the middle sides, the, the middle tail length is the best for uh, achieving selectivity and activity. And this is quite unusual because uh, uh, normally, you will think that uh, the shortest ligands, the better, because they are highly permeable. So if they are shorter, the, your molecule, your reactant, will be able to access the surface uh, more uh, efficiently. And ideally, maybe no ligands at all will be the best. Well, this is not the case because the ligands here, in addition to being uh, to the permeability, of course, to control the accessibility of the surface to the, to the molecules, they also have this tail length, which control the hydrophobicity close to hydrophobicity, hydrophobicity close to the catalyst. And so here, basically, in the case of the CO2, it, it results that the hydrophobicity, having a, like a, a certain hydrophobicity of this tail, uh, helps uh, keeping away the water molecule and promoting basically the uh, CO2 reduction. So what I showed you with all this example is really that uh, we can start uh, to uh, use our nanocrystal to advance the catalyst design in CO2 reduction. So we understood that the facets that are exposed are important, but also the ratio between the facets is important. And we could do this only by changing the sides. I also showed you that interfaces are important. So they just only mixing the catalyst might not give you uh, this fine tuning of, uh, that is achievable by tuning the interfaces. And this is true for the different system that, uh, that I shared with you. And also that because they are so monodispersed in size and shape, they can help to elucidate the reconstruction mechanism. Now, I made the synthesis quite easy. Uh, 
but the problem is that uh, we have now a really a real challenge in nanochemistry, which is still the synthesis, because the synthesis still proceeds via trials and error. So nanochemistry is not like organic chemistry, where you have a target and you, you know how to reach that target. In most cases, of course, you have different options, but in most cases, you have options. Here, in most cases, we, we rely on our intuition, on trials and errors, and this makes it really difficult to target uh, unexplored classes of materials. So as I mentioned before, you will hear from, from Valeria what we really, the type of work that we do to really understand the chemistry, which is behind the formation of these nanocrystals, because I really believe that only if we do that, then we'll be able to really uh, address the, the chemistry challenges which are behind your synthesis. And now I will share with you one last example where we were trying, always looking for new catalysts. We got inspired by this uh, machine learning uh, paper by Ulissi. So what he was uh, mentioning, um, so remember I said, oh, we have to combine uh, copper with other metals. One option was, uh, was uh, silver. Here he mentioned, uh, well, if you try to uh, combine, to, if you alloy copper and gallium, uh, you will really find an optimal binding energy for CO and you will really promote uh, um, uh, C2 plus product. All right, so we wanted to make this copper silver alloy. And we decided to rely on a reaction that is very well known for noble metals. So the, the community of nanocrystals has really studied this galvanic replacement reaction very well. And based on what is known, we were expecting that the gallium will behave like other metals. And that in the presence, because of the, um, of the redox potential of these two metals, we were expecting that the gallium in the presence of copper two plus the gallium will uh, oxidize while the copper will reduce and will eventually form uh, copper gallium alloys or maybe allow copper gallium alloys. So Laia, my student, tried this, uh, this uh, uh, experiment and so she reacted the gallium nanoparticles with uh, a copper molecular precursor and we obtained these nanodimers again. Now, the nanodimers, they make sense in the case of silver copper, because based on the bulk phase diagram, silver and copper are immiscible. Copper and gallium, they should alloy. So at this point, what we understood is that this gallium, which is a liquid metal, so this is the characteristic of gallium that is different, is a liquid metal, is not the same as the noble metal. So at this point, we wanted to understand, is first of all a galvanic replacement reaction taking place? If it's taking place, then what is the role of the oleylamine? Because oleylamine is normally used as a reducing agent during the synthesis of nanocrystals. And why are they not forming an alloy? So Laia started to go through this, uh, to answer into this question. And first of all, she took time aliquots and she took time aliquots and she saw that the gallium domain becomes smaller and smaller. It also, um, it also shrinks so it, it's also kind of, it deforms as the copper is growing. So the gallium uh, dissolves as the copper is growing, which is really consistent with the galvanic replacement reaction. And she indeed, indeed find also the gallium ions in solution. So this behavior was consistent. But then what about the oleylamine? Well, the oleylamine actually, uh, what, uh, what it does is again, here um, Laia runs some uh, cyclic voltammetry on the complexes that form between the copper and this ligand. And what she found is that actually, so this is the copper um, uh, acetate and this is the copper uh, um, amine complex. So what the amine does is basically by shifting towards uh, um, more positive potential, the first reduction of copper, uh, um, the, the reduction of uh, copper plus to copper two plus, it basically increases the driving force for uh, the galvanic replacement reaction. It's not a reducing agent because if we use a reducing agent like triotilphosphine, the, the copper just nucleates. So the role of the amine is to complex the copper and to change the driving force of uh, the galvanic replacement reaction. So what about the shape that we obtain? So gallium, as I said, is special, it's a liquid metal and it has a high oxophilicity. So it comes with an oxide scheme. And so our question was, what does this oxide scheme do during the reaction? 
because we can do electromicroscopy analysis. And of course, because we have to observe the sample, we are going to see oxide no matter what, because it's really high oxophilicity. What we did in this case was again to use uh, uh, X3 absorption spectroscopy. So we, go, we went to the synchrotron, making sure that, no, that the sample saw no air. And what we learn uh, with this uh, um, measurement is that actually the oxide is present. So this is the oxide. And our sample is always in between the gallium metal and the oxide, no matter at which stage of the reaction which basically indicates that the oxide is present throughout the reaction. And the reason why the oxide is increasing over, the oxide fraction is increasing over time is because the gallium is eventually becoming smaller. And this is basic, what about the shape? So why we get this shape? Well, what I'm showing you, you are, uh, uh, what happens to a liquid gallium drop that uh, sticks on a surface, so actually it turns out that this gallium oxide has really special viscoelastic and rheological pro pro uh, properties. So basically it really sticks to metallic surfaces. So it's kind of similar to what happens at our interface between the copper and gallium. So this was quite interesting for us. And so we could explain eventually what, what happens during these, uh, using these, uh, exploring the reactivity of this uh, gallium at the nanoscale. So the gallium is liquid, we have a shell of oxide. There are some micro cracks. I mean, these gallium ions somehow pass through these uh, small cracks or pinholes in this uh, oxide shell. The galvanic replacement reaction occurs, but because of the presence of this oxide shell, there is not a lowing, but instead we have the formation of these dimers. And what Laia was able to demonstrate is also that this happens in the case of gallium silver, we can also start to grow copper gallium silver dimers. So we can start to combine more metal together. And now she's exploring also indium. Indium is quite unique because it's less oxophilic than the gallium. So we really want to explore the role of this oxide shell. And also indium, uh, we can obtain it as liquid or, uh, uh, or not, depending on the temperature. So we are gonna use now indium as a platform to explore more of this liquid metal. And um, I want to connect now also to the talk that Chetna will, will give, because um, basically we also deal with other difficult, what I call difficult materials. So not everything is easy, and we try really to understand the chemistry to then develop mm, nanomaterials which are well-defined and tunable. So we are also working with the meta, uh, Anna and uh, my new student, Ona, they are working on uh, developing these uh, oxide shells using uh, this uh, colloidal atomic layer deposition approach. So again, understanding the chemistry, the interface here is crucial. And then Chetna will follow with their talk on uh, multinary oxide nanocrystals, where basically the challenge is really because we have multi uh, cations, uh, multiple cations within the same structure. Here, one of the challenges is how do we have all the elements uniformly and homogeneously distributed within the nanocrystal without phase segregation while controlling the size and shape. So Chetna will show you how we are trying to address this uh, challenge. And so yeah, in the end of my talk, I want to conclude it by, by saying that science is a balancing act. So we don't have a black and white, we have often gray and we have to try to understand trends. And to understand these trends, we really need to develop the chemistry of well-defined and tunable materials. They are crucial in many fields, including catalysis, that is what I share with you today. And I would like to acknowledge the beautiful group of people that I have the pleasure to work with, current students, past PhD students, so Chetna just finished a few months ago, collaborators that I tried to mention throughout my talk, and uh, uh, funding for support and also facilities because uh, we use uh, uh, PSI and DSRF for our uh, uh, X-ray studies and uh, you for your attention and again the European Chemical Society for the award. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Rafaela, for this uh, excellent talk on such an important topic as is uh, CO2 conversion and for this very 
uh, original approach of uh, finding catalysis in, 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 in within the nanocrystals. I am also very much impressed that the uh, very young and productive group that you have from what I have seen. And okay, I would really encourage you to, to keep on with this group and keep on producing as you have up to now. So really, I mean, we knew that, but uh, you have convinced us that the, that, that the award was really deserved. So thank you very much. I don't know if uh, there are any questions and answers. You know, you can use the questions and answers option in the in the Zoom. Well, it's again not the same as when you will see each other. And uh, but I don't know if anyone would like to ask a question or maybe Barbara, if you would like to add something or. Yeah, thank you very much. It was really a very interesting talk, and it's also um, I'm also. Um, um, personally, I'm also interested in this topic, so it's an additional pleasure, of course. <laughs> and I know how difficult it is uh, to to like uh, investigate these uh, interfaces, for example, between gallium and copper. And it's very impressive what you have been able to achieve. Um, um, I wondered, um, is it kind of difficult to separate the effect of um, kind of having different facets, different directions? from the effect of having different sizes of the particles? Is it possible to differentiate between the two? Ah, good question. Uh, yeah, to differentiate if it's more, yeah, how much the size effect and how much the facet effect. Mm. Um, well, I think it will be possible by designing maybe uh, so what we are doing now in um, yeah what we are doing now in uh, another collaboration is basically to uh, achieve because this if, if it's just a matter of uh, surface area uh, we are trying to use to 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 make sure we have for example the same overall surface area of one zero zero but in one case this one zero zero overall surface area is provided by small particles and in the other case is provided by bigger particles. Yeah. So we are trying to make this comparison by having same surface area exposed but different sizes. So we are waiting actually the, yeah, for, for this. This is the last, uh, is the last experiment that we have been doing actually. Yeah, mm. it's really is difficult it, to separate the It's two difficult, yeah. but maybe we can have some hint actually about this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I, I, uh, maybe there is a question. Uh, 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 Christoph uh, Copper, uh, shall I read it? Uh, or, or, I can, or, I also see it. Actually. Okay, then so. you can answer Christoph. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, Christoph, because we, we see each other quite often, actually. So, yeah, what is the, yeah? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, in electrocatalysis, I have a student, so my new student, Valerie, is investigating them. And what we see when, because the gallium is liquid, so the gallium is also used as a self-healing contact in electronics. So what we see when we start to apply a negative potential to this gallium is that we do remove the oxide shell and the, the gallium starts to behave uh, quite uh, in a unique way which uh, we are still trying to understand. So eventually we, it does not alloy, it does something quite interesting, but maybe we can take advantage of this uh, uh, elimination of the gallium shell while we are, uh, a, a gallium oxide shell, while we are applying the potential. So it's uh, interesting, but in related to this self feeling in uh, electronics. So the, I think it's uh, interesting. And in thermal catalysis, yeah, I have no idea. So maybe we should. Uh, we should test them <laughs> for, uh, for CO2 hydrogenation. <laughs> it will be interesting, the comparison, actually. Well, OK, thank you very much, Christophe. And thank you, Rafaela, for your answer. Uh, if there are no further questions, then we will proceed to provide you with the award. Uh, <laughs> uh, Laura? Wait. Okay, uh, you know, uh, we are very pleased uh, to have you as a lecture awardee 2018 and 
well, this is the best that we have done because we could not give you flowers. So, Rafaela, <laughs> congratulations again and hope we can celebrate it sometime in the near future in person. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much again. <laughs> and uh, yes. <laughs> And uh, now uh, I think uh, Rafaela is going to introduce uh, two of her young students and who are going to give uh, short lectures on this topic also to complement some very interesting things that we have heard today. So Rafaela, the floor is yours again. Thank you. Yes, so it's a pleasure. I've chosen two of my students with uh, um, Valeria and she will start uh, uh, with presenting our work on uh, um, looking into the uh, mechanism, formation mechanism of uh, copper nanocrystals. So she will start first. And then uh, there is uh, Chetna that uh, she recently uh, graduated. So it's the first student from my group that uh, uh, just left. And uh, Chetna will share with you some of our work again on developing the chemistry to access uh, polyelemental nanomaterials and specifically metal oxide. So I will leave uh, Valeria first to share her screen and uh, to share uh, the work that she has done. Okay, can you see? Yes. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm uh, Valeria and it's uh, my pleasure to share with you some of the in-situ research work we have done in the laboratory of Professor Bonsanti. And in particular today, I will be giving you some insights into reaction intermediates via in-situ X-ray spectroscopy to predict the synthetic pathway for shape controlled copper nanocrystals. So as uh, Professor Bonsanti already told you, the colloidal synthesis of nanocrystal still proceeds via trial and error approaches. And so we really need to understand the reaction mechanism underlying nanocrystal formation in order to move towards a more rational synthetic design. So our strategy here is to uh, directly monitor these chemical transformations by in situ X-ray spectroscopy using a custom-made reaction cell that mimics the, the typical colloidal reaction flask. And so we can exactly reproduce the typical laboratory environment while acquiring X-ray absorption and scattering data up to 300 degrees. So um, as, you, uh, as, you, as you already know, the system that we decided to investigate is uh, copper nanocrystals, and we are interested in the shape control synthesis of copper nanocrystal in order to uh, finally obtain selectivity during the CO2 reduction reaction. Now, in order to achieve this uh, shape control, we should first identify the key parameter that will enable us to synthesize one shape rather than another one. We should first uh, understand under which conditions, for example, we can obtain uh, copper spheres that are actually truncated of tahedra, or instead under which other conditions uh, we can synthesize other shapes that will correspond to the local minima in the Gibbs free energy diagram. And so we started our investigation by following two procedures that were already reported in literature. What was shown was that we can obtain copper spheres or cubes according to the type of ligand employed. And specifically when we use a trioctylphosphine, copper spheres are obtained. Instead, when we use trioctylphosphine oxide, copper cubes were achieved. And here, the most trivial explanation will be that the shape control is dictated by the binding energies of these ligands to the different uh, uh, nanocrystal phases. So this time, we wanted to go a bit farther and see if this was the case. So the synthesis that we are studying consists of three main stages. First, we have a plateau 80 degree, then a heating ground to 260 degree, and then a plateau at its final temperature. And we monitor each of these uh, stages by complementing in situ X ray absorption spectroscopy with ex situ TM, NMR, and mass spec. So, using uh, our in situ reaction cell, we collected the X sub spectra for the reaction mixture during the first stage. And based on these spectra, what we found out is that copper bromine and olelamine 
which represent the initial ejection, uh, the initial uh, reaction mixture, uh, form a pseudo tetrahedrical structure, which undergoes a complete ligand exchange with TOP to form a bimetallic complex, and partial ligand exchange with TOPO to form a monometallic complex. And also the FT uh, calculations were in agreement with the substitution of olelamine by TOP to be extremely favored, even at room temperature. Instead, the substitution of olelamine by TOPO possibly occurs when we increase the temperature. So once we have ident identified this reaction mechanism, these uh, copper one complexes, then we follow their evolution during the second stage, during the heating ramp, where a disproportionation reaction is occurring during both synthesis with TOP and with TOPO. However, it's only during the synthesis with TOP that we can see in the collect exchange spectra uh, that the signal of copper zero increases faster compared to copper one and copper two. Instead, during the synthesis with TOPO, the three chemical species all follow the same kinetics until we reach the plateau at 260 degrees. Now we can see that already uh, during, the, during the synthesis with TOPO, already after 10 minutes from when the plateau is reached, we have a rapid increase in the signal of copper zero, while at the same time, the, the signal of copper one and copper two decrease in intensity. So in order to explain these different disproportionation kinetics, uh, what we did was to consider the chemical nature of these copper one complexes that we saw forming during the first stage. And so during the synthesis with TOP, the disproportionation is more favored considering the proximity of the two copper one centers in the bimetallic complex. Instead, during the synthesis with TOPO, the disproportionation is lower because the first two equivalents of the monometallic complex should approach one another and then associate to favor the electron transfer. So if now we identify the copper zero species as the monomers, what we learn is that a gradual monomer release as obtained during the synthesis with TOP will enable us to uh, synthesize the uh, most thermodynamically favored shape, which are uh, spheres. Instead, a fast monomer release as obtained during the synthesis with TOPO will lead to kinetic products such as cubes in this case. And so having learned this, then we started to explore other ways to uh, control this monomer flux. And uh, um, in particular, what we did was to pre-synthesize these, uh, uh, reaction, these uh, reaction intermediates and then inject them into the solvent using different modalities. And we expect a fast monomer flux from a rapid injection and a slow monomer flux from a dropwise injection for the same temperature. And so playing around with the monomer flux, we could further explore the energy landscape of the reaction and to access other kinetic products such as uh, octahedra or tetrahedra, where the latter ones were not uh, synthesized before in the case of copper. So back to our diagram, we can now label the x-axis as the increasing monomer flux since this is the key parameter in order to move from thermodynamically to kinetically driven uh, products in the energy landscape of metal nanocrystals such as uh, uh, copper. Another important uh, point uh, evidenced in our study is that uh, ligands are, acti uh, are actively taking part of the reaction. And uh, indeed, this is what we also observed uh, uh, during this time, the size controlled uh, synthesis of copper nanospheres, of monodispersed copper nanospheres here shown by this DM image. Now, in this case, what we found out is that, is that tetradesilphosphonic acid, which is the ligand, is actually involved in the formation of a coordination polymer lamella along with the cuprous ions. And, that, uh, and then these uh, reaction intermediates uh, undergoes a reduction reaction to form uh, monodispersed uh, uh, copper nanocrystals. And once again, we could deduce this reaction mechanism by uh, using in situ X-ray uh, spectroscopy. And here, for example, I'm showing you uh, in situ XRD patterns and the Sachs spectra collected at different, uh, different temperatures where both of them 
Uh, in both of them, we could uh, follow the uh, formation of the lamella and then its uh, evolution into copper uh, uh, particles. And so once we have identified this reaction intermediate, then we, um, then we modified uh, its concentration in order to access bigger copper, bigger sized copper nanocrystals with a higher degree of monodispersity as it was then confirmed by TM analysis. And so in conclusion, in our uh, uh, in-situ works, uh, we have revealed that uh, uh, ligands are not simply acting as uh, uh, surface passivating agents, but they too uh, take part of the reactions by forming, in one case, uh, metallic complexes that uh, uh, have an impact on the monomer release, uh, and uh, in the other case, uh, by forming this lamella hotspot, which are responsible for the monodispersity of uh, uh, the final nanoparticles. And so, yeah, in conclusion, as a future perspective, these uh, uh, findings motivate us to perform similar uh, in situ studies, also to investigate uh, other underexplored class of materials. And so with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> Very good, Valeria. <clears throat> And uh, so I guess we try to take questions uh, later or uh, so we take questions for both uh, Valeria and Chatna later. So now I think uh, Chatna can uh, start their presentation as well. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chetna and uh, it's a privilege today to um, show my work, which is titled nanocrystals as precursors in solid state reactions for size and shape controlled uh, polyelemental nanomaterials. Uh, today, I'll be talking a lot about uh, multinary metal oxides. And what I mean by that is uh, metal oxides which have two or more metals in their structure. Um, and these are very important class of materials because they are active materials for different applications such as uh, batteries, catalysis, they've also been used uh, uh, for smart windows and very recently they've been, start, they've been used as uh, uh, photo absorber materials. Um, and uh, the composition and morphology of these multinary metal oxides are very important because they control the, the performance of these materials. From a synthetic point, uh, it's very difficult to control this composition and morphology uh, because uh, there's always a competition between phase segregation uh, versus formation of homogeneous composition. And this is especially challenging in the case of colloidal chemistry, because uh, when we have ternary oxides forming, then there's always a competition and there, there needs to be a balance in reactivity of the different precursors that we are using. So this is quite challenging in the case of colloidal chemistry. So an alternative approach that uh, I show in my work here is based on thin film um, uh, technology. So making thin films of these multinary metal oxides and what we do here is to use uh, shape and size controlled nanocrystals as a precursor so that these uh, nanocrystals can react with each other to form the ternary oxide. Um, and in this study, we focused on copper and iron oxide as a nanocrystal precursor, which react with each other to form copper iron oxide nanocrystals. This is mainly because uh, copper and iron oxide is very well studied system and there is a lot of uh, uh, literature available for synthesis of shape and size controlled copper as well as iron oxide nanocrystal. Uh, so what we did is uh, we reacted these two nanocrystals and here what I show is the identical location TM image. So we start with copper and iron oxide nanocrystals as a film. And when we anneal the sample to 750 degrees Celsius, actually what happens is all this copper starts reacting with the iron oxide. Uh, in the panel A, the small spheres are all copper nanocrystals and the big spheres are all iron oxide nanocrystals. And what we saw from this um, identical location image is that uh, the copper iron oxides that are formed actually have the size which is very close to that of the iron oxide that we start with. Uh, the formation of this copper iron oxide was further characterized using high resolution TM as well as elemental maps which show 
which show that this is the copper ion oxide that we are forming. Once we knew that we were able to form this copper ion oxide nanocrystals, we wanted to understand how is the reaction mechanism uh, that's taking place uh, for the formation of this copper ion oxide. So the next step that we did is to use, uh, is to make a binary nanocrystal assembly. So what you see here is that uh, each of this big sphere is a copper nanocrystal, and it's always surrounded by six iron oxide nanocrystal around them. So we have this uh, assembly of copper and iron oxide uh, nanocrystals, and we studied them using uh, electron microscopy-based studies. So we relied heavily on ele elemental maps of these crystals, as well as electron diffraction patterns to understand the transformation of these uh, materials that are taking place. In addition to the elemental maps, what we also used is the collocation analysis of these maps so that we can quantitatively uh, know and have a, a measure of the homogeneity of the sample. So in these um, collocation maps, if we have the density over in the axis, what it means is that the copper and the iron are actually separated as the case here. And more uh, closer the two uh, density starts moving further towards the diagonal, it means that the crystals are very homogeneous. In addition to that, we also start using a correlation coefficient as a, a quantitative number to have an idea of the uh, homogeneity of the crystals. Um, so what we did is we started annealing this assembly to different temperatures. And already at 600 degrees Celsius, we were able to see that there is an interdiffusion of the copper and iron species taking place. And at 750 degrees Celsius, we already had copper iron oxide nanocrystals formed. And further at 850 degrees Celsius, we were seeing sintering of these copper iron oxide samples forming uh, large particles of copper iron oxide. So from this study, we concluded that uh, above 750 degrees Celsius, we were having large particles of copper iron oxide, and it was difficult to um, control the shape of these uh, particles. Uh, and already at six, from the sample at 600 degrees Celsius, we were able to confirm that copper is indeed the diffusing species. And if we want to have control over the shape and size of these uh, nanocrystals, it's important to control the diffusion of this copper species. Uh, so the next step that we did was to make uh, bulk films of copper iron oxide. So uh, what we understood from this uh, study is that we wanted to have a very well mixed copper iron oxide precursor to be deposited. So this we were able to achieve by a, a control drop casting of very dilute uh, solutions of copper and iron oxide, which ensured that there is uh, always a well mixed copper iron oxide precursor on a thin film. Uh, and when we annealed such a sample to higher, like 750 degrees Celsius, we were able to form phase pure copper iron oxide films. And this was also confirmed using exit diffraction from these um, th uh, thin films. Uh, so once we were able to form these thin films of uh, uh, copper iron oxide uh, materials, the next step that we wanted to do was to explore if we can uh, make copper based ternary oxides of other material. So in this, uh, what we, in this study, what we did is also react copper with vanadium oxide, manganese oxide, and gallium particles. And in all these cases, we were actually forming copper vanadates, copper manganese oxide, and copper gallium oxide. However, in the case of copper manganese oxide and copper gallium oxide, we were able to also preserve the shape and the size of the, the ternary oxide very close to that of the binary oxides that we were starting with. Uh, so, and, but it was not the case for copper vanadate uh, because we were forming large particles of copper vanadates. Uh, so in order to understand why we were forming this, uh, we started looking at the thermal stability of the binary oxide, which is the vanadium oxide, manganese oxide, and gallium particles. And when we uh, annealed only these binary oxides, what we saw is that vanadium oxide at the reaction temperature was forming really large particles of uh, V2O5. However, in the case of manganese oxide and gallium particles, these are quite thermally stable. So uh, from this study, we concluded that if we have a binary oxide which is thermally stable, it can act as a reactive template on which we can grow the shape control ternary, uh, copper-based ternary oxide. Um, 
the next step that we wanted to do was to understand the reaction uh, intermediates that we are forming uh, during the formation of these materials. So we started looking at, um, so started annealing the, the materials to shorter times so that we could look at the intermediates uh, of this reaction. Uh, we did it for the case of copper iron oxide, copper manganese oxide, and copper gallium oxide. And in each of these cases, what we saw is that we had a shell of copper-based ternary oxide um, so what we, uh, from this, we concluded that the reaction mechanism actually is that first the copper starts diffusing and then it nucleates on the, on the binary oxide. And then we have a shell of uh, ternary oxide formed. And then at longer annealing times, the, the reaction front goes from the shell all the way to the core until we have a fully converted uh, copper-based ternary oxide. Um, and then what we wanted to do was to use it for an application. So uh, we did uh, uh, the same size of copper iron oxide cuboids and spheres. And uh, we, uh, we, checked, we uh, checked the selectivity of these materials for photoelectrochemical CO2 reduction reaction. Uh, and it was interesting that uh, in this case, the cuboids were actually having higher activity towards the photoelectrochemical CO2 reduction, as well as the selectivity of these cuboids uh, for formate was higher uh, in comparison to the spheres. Uh, this was uh, pretty interesting because here we were able to show that indeed morphology was, uh, can be used as a parameter to tune the selectivity of these photocathodes for uh, photoelectrochemical CO2 reduction reaction. And with this, I would like to conclude and would like to say that this uh, synthesis approach uh, is a new avenue for synthesis of uh, functional, functional and uh, tunable polyelemental nanomaterials. Uh, with, with this, I would like to thank uh, Professor Bosanti for guiding me with this project and uh, uh, all the collaborators and the students that helped me with this project, uh, as well as SNSF for the funding. Uh, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any of the questions. Right, very good also, Chuck. <laughs> it's nice, I'm sharing, I'm sharing your talks. So thank you to both of you for, uh, for being here with me. So <laughs> let's see if uh, we have any questions, uh, I guess, from, uh, from uh, the chat. Ah, there is one question for Valeria. So there is David asking, do you think that your conclusion about the monomer flux controlling the shape of the nanocrystals can be applied to other metallic, bimetallic, or metal oxide systems? Okay, so yeah, this is actually a very good question. What, uh, um, what I think is that uh, um, our findings can be applied for the synthesis of other Base centric cubic metals, for example, nickel. For sure, okay, but in this case, what we should tune is the monomer flux. Mm -hmm. So, what we should change according to the, I'm taking nickel as an example, according to the nickel precursor, we should change the ligands that we are using in order to form. I don't know, other uh, reaction intermediates with a different chemical nature that then will affect the monomer flux. Mm -hmm. So for sure we, we should try, but uh, um, yeah, the energy landscape that I show that is valid for all uh, phase centric cubic metals uh, uh, based on the specific surface energy of the crystallography facet exposed on the nanocrystal surface. So, but, uh, for each uh, system, it's a new story. We should, uh, yeah, as, as I said, I think we should um, then uh, see what, which type of ligand will uh, enable to control the, the monomer flux uh, as we did in the case of copper. Mm. Yeah. I agree. I think it's about the finding the chemistry which allows you to. So I think the monomer flux, I mean, it is applicable. And then it's the chemistry that will be nice. developed. Then we have another question, I guess, is for all of us, which is about the scalability of uh, uh, the synthesis. So I've been thinking uh, uh, quite a bit about this because we were writing also one uh, like scale up uh, project. And, uh, um, and the question is for scale up, do we pursue a more uh, uh, 
solution-based synthesis based on uh, some like big batch reactor or maybe uh, based on microfluidic approaches, which are also appropriate for scale up, or do we adapt our synthesis to gas phase? Because there is a company in Switzerland, which is Avantama, that they actually do scale up of nanoparticle synthesis, but they do use a gas phase process. So one option will be trying to adapt our chemistry to gas phase, which I think is interesting. And the other option is just uh, building batch reactor, as long as we think about scalability when we develop the synthesis. In the end, we don't want like hot injection to be involved because if you rely on an hot injection, there is no way to scale it up. So I think it's, if we rely on just heating up a pot of reagents, the scalability should not be a big issue. But of course, we have to deal with different way which heat is transferred, but engineers should, should be able to help us with that. So eventually, I don't think it's a big issue. Also, um, actually, my postdoc advisor, she also has a startup company on uh, smart windows in California, and also they are using nanoparticles, and they were able to scale up the synthesis. So should be. <laughs> and uh, uh, then we have a question for Chetra, actually, I think, that is uh, from uh, Barbara. And this is about uh, the same, uh, yeah, the same structure of uh, uh, manganese and the copper manganese oxide. And this is also the case for uh, uh, iron oxide and copper iron oxide. So the structures are very similar. Yeah. So we had the same issues uh, when we were using mm -hmm. high resolution TEM to understand the intermediates. We were not mm -hmm. able to uh, differentiate between the two because of the crystal structure. They are so close. They, they are a bit different. The, the parameters are a bit different, but they are super close to be differentiated using microscopy. Uh, but we were using elemental maps to be sure that when we have both copper and manganese in the same crystal, and we were using uh, EDX spectra to make sure that the copper and manganese ratio is one is to two, then we know that it's copper uh, manganese oxide that we are forming. So we were relying more on the elemental maps when we have very close crystal structure. Yeah. What, what is the spatial resolution of the elemental maps? The, uh, so for the copper manganese oxide, especially when I was having big crystals uh, close to 40 nanometers, they were quite good. So we had each pixel uh, quite good uh, for uh, the, the crystals were bigger than the resolution of the pixels, let's say. So EDX is on the nanometer scale. Yeah, yeah. also uh, I had uh, uh, 20 nanometers up to 40 nanometers for these samples. So maybe it's not highly reliable when we have very small five nanometer particles. But uh, for this study, we were, I think, quite good. We were above 15 nanometers for sure. And uh, the resolution is, is good for, uh, for these crystals, yeah. Thank and you. Of course, I think complement also with some of the X-ray spectroscopies also will be also another, um, yeah, mm -hmm. another thing to do in, actually. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> okay, then uh, it doesn't look like there are uh, more questions. <laughs> So yeah, it was a pleasure to share your uh, talks, uh, <laughs> Valeria and uh, Chatna. <laughs> uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rafaela, and thank you very much, Valeria and Chetna, for your excellent talks. Uh, now we are coming to the end of this uh, event. I would like to finish, of course, by congratulating you, Rafaela, not only for your excellent uh, work, but also for the excellent uh, group that you lead. As I say, you have given us an example of how dynamic and productive they are. I want to thank very much uh, the jury uh, for having uh, chaired all of this, and in particular, Barbara Albert, who has uh, have been joining us today and participating very actively. Uh, thank you also to the UKM Secretariat for the perfect organization of this webinar. Sometimes these webinars are more complicated to arrange than a face-to-face -face thing, but I think everything has worked perfectly. And of course, I have to thank all the attendees and all the participants, and in particular to our, young, uh, our two young speakers who have done an excellent job, and I encourage you to keep on participating in, in future webinars. Uh, let me finish by insisting that, uh, well, uh, there is a call open for next uh, applications for the lecture award. 
we, we would like to have many candidates for the lecture award, but also candidates for the jury, which we have to nominate again a, a jury. And uh, let me also tell you that uh, the uh, lecture award is just one of the many awards that we have in, in UCAMS, which range from the gold medal to the historical landmark. And if you are interested in, in, in these awards and in what they consist on and, and how to apply or how to participate in them, I am very pleased to inform you that we are going to have a UCAMS Awards information session on the 24th of November this year. So with plenty of time to, to present your applications because most of them will be closed at the end of, of 2020. And I really encourage you all to, to participate and find out a lot about the other awards that we in UCAMS have. So I think that's about all. Thank you very much all again and uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you again for this honor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>